thanks for having us, Janis. Uh, must say it's uh, great to be uh, like you know uh, as an artist in Ljubljana with this kind of crazy history of contemporary arts and stuff which is really influential for us, like you know Leibach, NSK, um, Net Art People, the Janis Jansha project. So this is uh, all things which are kind of have influence, you know, and they have they're also influential to young artists which are living in Switzerland. So, um, thanks for that opportunity to work here. Yes, yes. Um, we're a meeting group of Bitnik from Zurich, um, Doma, Carmen, and we would like to, so, no, I have to start over. So, we're showing the Random Dark Net Chopper, which is a work which started in autumn of 2014 with an exhibition at Kunsthalle St. Gallen in Switzerland. Um, it's basically a software that goes shopping in the deep web once a week for uh, a maximum of $100 in bitcoins and has the article it chooses randomly sent directly to the exhibiting gallery. So um, here this show um, here in, in at Axioma is running for five weeks. That's why you have the five vitrines where the items will be placed once they arrive. So we have started like three weeks before the show opening. So we ha already have like three items the bot has bought. And because uh, the bot usually, uh, well, no, always goes shopping on Wednesdays. Uh, today is Wednesday. We thought we would shop with you today. Um, but we have to be honest, um, this is a bit of an experiment. Um, it doesn't always work the first time. Um, sometimes it doesn't work at all. We'll just have to see what happens. Yeah, so this is a, like a very instable network. Tor can break, the darknet cannot be accessible for us. The shop might be down or is too slow to react. So sometimes it takes us like hours of trying till the bot executes that order. But we'll try that. Maybe it works just like out of the first time. So we'll, we'll do that now, I think. Yes. Yes. So, um, as you'll see maybe in a minute, um, the, the bot is basically um, a collection of scripts of separate things that sort of um, happen. Yeah, and we'll start it now. It should open a browser and basically mimic human behavior and go through categories, go through articles, items which are sold, and it should choose one by itself. It will send a message to the buyer saying, hey, send whatever you have to Axioma Gallery in Ljubljana. This is the address. And uh, it will send the bitcoins it owns. So we'll see if that works. So it's logged in now. So it's done the capture, it's logged in. It looks good. We are in the category counterfeit items. <laughs> so and it would now basically, you know, open every page which uh, is like in that category, just like browse through all the articles. And we have an item. Ooh. Already bought one. Oh wow. So this was fast, was huh? Fast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, 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 so now it's still like it sends a message to, to the guy, it's an encrypted message, and this is it, it's finished. Huh? So the order is placed, uh, it's processing, um, it has been paid already, so this is all like digital. And uh, yeah, uh, we can go and check what it is. Um, so this is like the log file it produces. So it went through all I'm just like, um, all these items. So it yeah. started, it went to the gallery, uh, to the, cho to chose the random category counterfeit items, other, other subcategories, and then just like got all the items here, this list of 68 things which are sold. Uh, things like, uh, yeah, we could also have had a driver's <laughs> license from <laughs> Pennsylvania. <laughs> and, 
It bought that key set, that locksmith key set, which means it's uh, a tool of keys which help you open up cars. <laughs> so um, normally, you know, the guy who copies the keys, he, he, know, he has all those tools. So it's nothing illegal, I, I would say. It's just like uh, it's a standard werkzeug, uh, tool. A standard tool for locksmiths, but uh, it's sold here as a as something which which might um, help you open up uh, locks or doors or cars. And yes. this is coming from. It's Does com it, it doesn't say, so we ah, have okay. no, uh, we don't know where it comes from. It says from worldwide, and we just spent 38 uh, US dollars. So there is still uh, $60 left in the weekly budget. And yes, so maybe we can just go back and see the pictures. Um, yeah. So we're only the second buyer of this. The second buyer of this? Yes. So it looks like uh, iron metal, metallic. Yeah, and we'll see. Um, yeah, now basically we're waiting for them to arrive and uh, they will be placed in the forts uh, we train. Um, but we'll come back to the random dark net chopper <coughs> <coughs> yeah. later on, right? <coughs> we would like to um, shortly introduce you to some of our works uh, we've done before the Random Darknet Chopper to give you an idea of how we work, what our interests are, and also try to explain how we um, came up with this idea or what, what you know, was interesting to us. Um, the first work we would like to quickly show you is called um, Opera Calling. Uh, it's a work we did in 2007 uh, together with uh, Gabriel Voltaire in Zurich. Um, we were invited as, uh, to do a post-Dada show and we were really uh, intrigued by the Opera House we have in Zurich. Um, the Opera House sort of seemed to us at the time as to be sort of the absolute opposite of the internet. And we, as artists, come from the internet, so we sort of grew up, you know, artistically with copy and paste, with... Um, um, easy access to easy things. Easy access to things, easy publishing <laughs> of stuff. And then you, we have, in the same city, this opera house where it takes you forever to, you know, even become a singer or to be able to, you know... Perform. perform there. It's uh, not very accessible, it's very expensive, and... Um, we started thinking about this house and asked ourselves, how can we sort of open this very closed system of the Zurich Opera and try to, you know, engage it with... Um, Connect it to something, to the internet. To or the or contemporary. Yeah. And um, we <laughs> something we really like to do is look at media uses immediately after uh, media is int introduced. Uh, usually when a technology is introduced, um, newly introduced, it's used totally in a totally different way than later on when it becomes um, more uh, mass use. And this is one of those examples uh, which we found. It's uh, first use of the telephone. And um, so when the telephone was invented, um, it was commercially used quite um, rapidly but you couldn't, you know, um, sell it s telling people that they could buy a phone now and then wait for other people to also buy a phone and then they could call each other, that wouldn't have worked. So what they did was they connected any cultural institutions they had within a city to the telephone network. And it was basically the first remote um, access net networking device to um, give you something, give you a life experience of something which is not happening in the same room. So radio wasn't there yet. S so yeah. in, in, in that picture you basically see that there are like um, um, microphones on the stage in the yeah. opera and um, they're wired up with the telephone uh, operating um, room. room 
And from there, they would hook up the, uh, via, via telephone line uh, the people at home. So the people at home didn't have a telephone like we know. It was more like a radio, a horn, where you could listen um, to that live broadcast of, uh, of, of, of that opera in that specific uh, uh, place. So we were really interested in kind of, I mean, like, this is a nice system. And what happens if you reintroduce that, like, 100 years later? You know, we could basically take that as a model and we apply it now, so... But we wanted to, like, um, provide a service nobody had asked for and, and do it without asking for permission. Yes, and we like to hit people at their homes. You know, art mustn't be consumed in a gallery space. It can also, you know, happen at home over the telephone, maybe. So, um, yeah, we basically came up with the idea of bugging the Opera House, hide microphones in there, have the Cabaret Voltaire, the exhibition space as... The telephone exchange? As a telephone exchange, and there, just like randomly call, we had like a tele build a telephone machine, randomly call people from the phone book, which are living in Zurich and paying basically also for the Opera House as uh, taxpayers, and uh, call them. And when they would pick up, a voice would appear, saying, hey, the, the opera house is bugged. This is the autonomous opera telephone. Um, if you want to hear uh, this specific opera, which is playing now, uh, just stay in line. We'll make a connection. Beep. And then you would have like that lifeline to the, to the, to the opera house. So and this shows a picture of uh, like Swiss <laughs> national TV uh, news, a news feature when the Opera House started to look for those bugs which were hidden, the, those microphones which were hidden in the Opera House. And he was kind of surprised at that specific moment. This is the director of the Opera House. Um, because they thought they're dealing with James Bond-like devices which are, you know, taking over and hijacking their live feed. Uh, but we just used normal telephones, uh, mobile phones, cheap ones. Uh, some f phones we can you know, just like put somewhere and we can call them and they would pick up automatically and give us access to the, to, to the place. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, so this is how the box, the actual device looked like. So we, you know, it was super simple. We just like taped them so the, the display wouldn't lit up when, uh, when, when the call arrives and we attached or built a little bit of a better microphone. So, because I mean, like, telephone is not made for sounds. Um, for it's music. Made for music, it's made for voice. So mm -hmm. we wanted, you know, to nivellate that a little bit. So, yeah, and we um, basically started um, transmitting, calling people um, in February 2007. And um, the opera realized that what we were doing uh, about three days later when journalists called them asking them do you know you've been bugged and uh, how do you react so they um completely panicked and wrote <laughs> us a really harsh letter saying we would have to uh, debug the opera uh, within 48 hours and if not they would send in the swiss military and mm, we would have to pay for it yes and there was they were also wanted to sue us because of copyright infringement and because we didn't pay broadcasting fees <laughs> to the singers. And there was also like this very, very strange thing of that they said they would also source for libel. This means uh, when you speak bad about somebody. And this had to do with the bad audio quality. So the singers of the opera were afraid that the bad transmission quality would let the recipients of those calls uh, think that, you know, the music is bad or they cannot sing. And uh, so in the media, this David against Goliath game started like uh, to appear. They would ask us, um, how long would you do that? And we said, we won't stop till they find every bug inside the opera house. <laughs> and uh, then they would ask, journalists would ask, I mean, how many bugs are there? To one journalist, he would say two. To the other one, we would say five. To the next one, we would say 10. So it was like a constant, uh, 
uh, chaos uh, where nobody knew what's real, what's fiction, is it true, is it not? Yes. Mm -hmm. So we'd like to show you one of those calls as an example. We use that a lot in exhibitions at the moment or when we show so the piece. Yeah. And it's uh, basically um, a family receiving such a, call, such a call from our opera telephone. And it's Sunday afternoon and uh, they know about the story or some of them know about it and they tell it in their own, uh, with their own voice. It's like seven minutes. We'll listen to it for some minutes. Ja, hallo, Gritli. Hier ist das autonome Operntelefon der Stadt Zürich. Zu Ihrer Freude und Unterhaltung haben wir in der Zürcher Oper eine Wanze platziert. In wenigen Sekunden werden Sie live ins Opernhaus verbunden. Sie kennen bequem von Ihrem Wohnzimmer aus der heutigen Vorstellung von der Rosenkavalier von Richard Strauss die beiwohnen. Viel Spaß! Ja. Hallo, was soll das? <lacht> das ist großartig. Du, ich häng da auf, hä? Ich häng da auf, was soll das Ganze? Ich will ja keine Opa. Wie? Nee, noch nicht. Ja, hier, da singt einer, wunderschön. <lacht> ja, ja. Ja, 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 ja. Also hier, dann komm mal. Also die, <lacht> die Akustik ist eine absolute Katastrophe. Aber bitte. Was bringt hier? Da hast du das. Michael, ich, 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 ich muss euch die Aktion erklären. Die rufen Leute an, äh, äh, wählen die aus, so per Zufallsgenerator. Das Opernhaus, das wird so stark subventioniert und nur die reichen Leute, nur die reichen Leute haben was davon. Und jetzt haben sie Wanzen angebracht und das kann man die Oper jetzt live, das spielt sich jetzt ab, kann man das die Oper miterleben. So it basically goes on and they start to discuss, uh, uh, try to find out which opera it is and uh, they start to discuss the opera as an art form and the kid joins and it's really like a beautiful piece. Uh, and you can watch all the things we show you today also on our website, uh, it should be all online. So just like an image, this is, was how the telephone machine looked like at the Cabaret Voltaire. So this was like our, um, the only place you could also go and listen to the uh, opera. If retransmission. You, retransmission, um, if you weren't dial up, dial up uh, yes, at home. Mm -hmm. um, the second work we would uh, like to quickly introduce you to is delivery for Mr. Assange. Um, we work in London, or we have worked in London from time to time in, in the past years. And uh, we came across the situation of the Ecuadorian embassy behind Harrods in London, where Julian Assange has been living since 2012. Um, 
It has been surrounded by British police. No, it's not surrounded anymore. It was surrounded by British police between August 2012 and around October last year, so for around three years. Um, this meant that it was uh, completely um, encircled by, by police people standing there. Also, there were a lot of uh, surveillance vans around, so you actually, walking from Harrods, which is a very touristic area, um, shopping area, very high, very expensive also, you walked through the tourists and you were standing in this war zone. And for us as artists, it was one of the few places we encountered where you could actually physically see this ongoing dispute between the powers that be and people who fight for freedom of the internet or in some way or yeah. another. So you have like, you know, the situation of Julian Assange sitting inside the Ecuadorian embassy. Um, he has received asylum by the Ecuadorian state. At the same time, he cannot leave the embassy without being afraid of um, being uh, detained by the police. So it's kind of a stalemate situation. Uh, Julian Assange, the founder of WikiLeaks, uh, which leaked a lot of uh, national cables from the US. And since they did that in 2010? What, the leaking? Uh, yes. yes. 2010, when they leaked the Afghan war log files, uh, the story around WikiLeaks really started to turn around. And, uh, you know, kind of a, a repression also started. So they were like, financial blockades against WikiLeaks, so they couldn't have access to money. And now it's also that people involved with WikiLeaks are not able to travel anymore because they're stuck at, uh, uh, specific, uh, in specific mm. cities. Uh, Assange in London, other people in Berlin, um, uh, Edward Snowden in Russia, um, yeah, things like that. And we found this really interesting, or we found Julian Assange's situation uh, particularly interesting because he, is stuck at an embassy, which is still an accessible place, unlike a uh, high security military prison where Chelsea Manning is held, for example. And um, due to this um, surrounding of the building, you can also feel these, these powers clashing. And there was a, around the time when the UK surrounded th the, the embassy, there was also uh, discussions of um, what is a sovereign state? Can you just enter a foreign embassy as a, a hosting state? You know, what, you know, all these treaties that um, are in place and that are, but that are also crumbling through what is happening online. It's all begin, beginning to blur and it's not very clear, you know, um, what the rules actually are at the moment. And um, we asked ourselves, how can we intervene into this physical situation, can, is there anything we can do uh, as artists um, with internet access? Mm. Um, is there a way to physically break this, this barrier, this police barrier? And um, looking at the situation in London, we quickly realized that the postal system was one of the systems that uh, still functioned mm, really well. So there's something I'm like, you know, physical objects to go through the police barrier and they end up at the embassy. So, um, and this really started to interest us and we thought, well, what happens if we send Julian Assange a piece of mail? And then we realized, okay, if we want to know what's going to happen to this piece of mail, we need some kind of feedback. So we ended up building a parcel um, with a hole in the side. <coughs> And behind the hole, we placed a camera, and the camera um, took an image every 10 to 15 seconds and uploaded the image directly to the internet. So we had a parcel with a live feed um, of, you know, images of its surroundings. So the question was really like, you know, what kind of route would it take? Would it reach Assange? Would it? the police open, I mean like all open questions we couldn't really answer. So we addressed it to Julian Assange at the Ecuadorian Embassy uh, in West London and we flew to London and uh, would send the parcel from London to London because uh, you know living in Switzerland 
we would have like problems with customs and, and stuff, but we wouldn't, didn't want to test that. And also, we're kind of interested in this analog, this physical object to travel within the network because we knew if we send an email from Switzerland to Julian Assange in the Ecuadorian embassy, this was Chris Snowden, every state would make a copy of that email because if it's unencrypted, um, we have no rights there. There is no laws which protect us really. So, but with the old postal system, there's still like postal secrecy in, the mo in most countries in Europe, which protects, um, which basically pr protects that uh, the parcel can be opened without any warrant or you know w without any good reasons. But with digital communications, things are just grabbed, and everybody grabs everything if they can. So um, this is an X-ray scan of the box. Um, the camera at the top, batteries, and uh, the recharging gear. Um, so we posted the parcel at a post office and basically went home to watch the feed. Um, like anyone could also watch it. So it was also a, a complete loss of control, you know, placing this parcel and then not really knowing what was going to happen. So we had like this black screen with this live logo. This was like the place where the images would arrive and we would start also to tweet about it or just like give um, short, uh, precise messages of what's happening. So we couldn't really contextualize it. It was more like, hey, I think we are here. We think we are there. And uh, so basically people who would join the project, they could read through the log file and see you know, what has happened in the last hours. So, um, so this is like the first. It's actually um, it's a self-portrait because that's it's a Dorma selfie, yes. holding the, the, the box. Yes. <laughs> and I mean like the first, uh, it's 12 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, the first thing was, I mean like would they take it? You know, because it has this hole, it's addressed to Julian Assange. I mean, no idea if, if they would accept it, but, uh, you know, she they behind accepted the, it. Accepted it and it would disappear in a red bag. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we didn't know what to expect, but we would spend a lot of time in bags <laughs> and in like dark places, dark places <laughs> where we wouldn't know what, what's happening. So after an hour, still status unchanged. Um, the internet slowly started to realize there is something interesting happening. So um, we got a lot of users in that time already. And then it's after two hours, it just turned black. And we didn't know, you know, what does that mean? Is it, uh, you know, I mean, like our, our things we build are kind of, they're built well, but it's still like, you know, we are artists, we are not technicians, so they can break. We know that. So we thought like, fuck, is the camera already broken? Or has somebody, have they found the hole? Have they taped the hole? Because we had no signal f to it for one hour and it was kind of, you know, scary, scary for us. But then after another hour, at five o'clock, we realized that there is like a moving, uh, you know, that uh, the, the, the parcel is moving the GPS. Uh, the GPS, something is happening. Maybe the camera is broken, but GPS is still here. And then after three hours, the first image again, you know, a little bit of light. And we realized that we are like, wow, I've been taken out uh, of that thing. And we realized that, you know, actually this is unmanned photography. It's photography not made by humans, but made by machines, basically. And uh, we, we like that because normally you don't know what that postal system black boxes, but with that, we had access to it. It felt kind of strange and um, we always, yeah, you know, we started to have a relationship to the, to the parcel itself because, you know, it felt like you're like a cat or something, something which can break and if it breaks, it's bad and you don't want it, want it to die. And uh, yes, this, I think this is it. Yeah, this, this made it interesting. So you would see legs and uh, people pushing around trolleys, workers, and then it would get dark again. And 
Okay. We green bag. A green bag yeah. now. And the images spread quickly online and they were really widely commented and retweeted. Um, people had their own feeds going, you know, they would also take, like we did, take live, like images they liked and comment them and send them around. And um, around this time, our servers went down for the first time because um, it, they were just completely overloaded. We just didn't think. Expect so many people so trying many people to watch So many people to be that. interested yes. in this um, parcel <coughs> moving through the postal system. And um, people were really helpful online. They, um, you know, helped put up mirrors. Um, they... People wrote scripts to grab all the images because they thought we were going to go permanently offline. And, and you know, there is somebody they who has, has an archive have, of all the images. Yeah, they yeah. wanted to have an image archive. And well, other people started to analyze the, uh, using forensic software, analyze the blackness in the image because it was just black all the time. And they would like, you know, start to see differences in the blackness and then write us a mail that something is happening and that it's not that. And, you know, it's still here. Or they would, uh, people would analyze the images, especially of the postal, like the buildings, and say, I've worked there, and this is, this is happening to the parcel now, and this will be happening next. Yes, and we and would receive really long emails explaining the whole oh, parcel, si uh, the yes. uh, mail system. Because also, I mean, like, it's interesting because, I mean, like, it's, it's, it's a m piece of mail which is, you know, in a diplomatic circle, so we knew they have like special surveillance for that. They would scan it, you know, because the hosting country is kind of um, reliable or they should be, um, they should watch out for the embassies and so they don't get like, you know, uh, I don't know, it might be a bomb also because it looks like a bomb. So, um, yes, uh, at around 11, 12 o'clock we, we saw like, uh, um, a fast movement, a fast out, movement of the city. out of the city. It was kind of strange because we sent the parcel in East London, it should go to West London, and it just like passed West London and headed out of town. We were like, where the hell are we going? I mean, like, and everyone uh, on Twitter, people were going, Oh, we're going to find out where MI5 has, uh, has know, the office. secret yes. office. <laughs> so we'll know that now. And uh, those types of jokes. Yes, and then, you know, after. 12 o'clock we would, uh, the GPS would work uh, again and the image, images would come back and uh, we realized that we are just like next to Heathrow um, in a postal delivery center, which was kind of strange, you know, we were inside of town and they put us out 20 miles out of town um, to a bigger distribution center and uh, yes, it would disappear again and then head back to the city. And mm -hmm. uh, people on Twitter started to make jokes like, hey, come on, there's like so much optimization uh, possible. You know, we see that you should, you can do your job better. And uh, at around five o'clock, we were back in town. You know? So it's five mm -hmm. o'clock in the morning, black since hours, we didn't sleep the whole night because we needed to fix servers and build up the thing. And at around six or seven o'clock, we felt that you know, no, later. Later. Yeah, we're still at a delivery center yes, but near we are, Victoria. Yes, I think. but we are kind of re really near the embassy. So we are, you know, within two, three kilometers. And we thought, okay, maybe we'll be delivered today. I mean, like, uh, we don't know. So we were kind of in this waiting mood. You know, it could happen any m moment. And uh, so our next delivery center. <laughs> And then, like, the GPS movement after, after that would start going zigzag, you know, from house to house. And we weren't really sure, are we in a bag? Is somebody handing us out? Or are we in a van, you know, in a delivery van? We didn't know. Um, so around this time, also, the BBC started to cover it. And, you know, the bus got bigger. And, you know, I mean, BBC started to cover it. Our servers went down again. And we moved basically our main communication to Twitter because Twitter can handle um, that amount, but we couldn't really. Mm. So. And here the movement started to become 
stop and go. So we were quite sure we were moving or being moved by a delivery van, you know, this typical movement of go to the next house, wait, go to the next house, wait. And we were sort of circling around the embassy. And people started to tell us, hey, Bitnik, uh, when will be this part parcel be delivered? I really ne need to get some work done. <laughs> hey, Bitnik, <laughs> I'm watching this black rectangle with that live logo since 24 hours. I mean, like, uh, you know, I, I can't anymore. Uh, I'm really exhausted. Or, hey, Bitnik, nobody is working at my office. Uh, you know what's happening? And we're like, no, we don't, so, as you are. And I mean, like, people also started to ask if somebody's nearby. You know, can somebody <laughs> go physically over Twitter? Can somebody go and see what this post? What man, this van is doing. What this van is doing. So 11.50, 12 o'clock, the police is still there. Huh? It's not, and we are really near now. I think we are just like, um, yeah, uh, half, a half a mile away miles. from the, from the deliveries, from the embassy. Embassy address. And we kept getting these images of something white, looked like postal bags. We weren't sure. It's already one o'clock. Moved a bit closer, status unchanged, it's dark again. And, and then we got uh, this view of the street. Like the first street view. And we knew we are near because the architecture totally looked like that. Yeah. And yes, here we also realized that we are actually in a van. Yeah. <laughs> and here's a hand. And dark again, black again. And it's empty. And then other mail coming in. We were really worried at this point that, you know, the postal worker had sort of read the address going like, no, I'm not going to deliver this. Yeah. I'll just send it back. And then but around two, this thing here, we thought maybe it's a finger, you know, in front of the, f in front of the camera. Then here, like some stone thing. It's like a stone and this is like um, a delivery a folder, folder. A delivery list we think we are in front of the embassy now image is black all dark we must be directly in front of the embassy same location black nothing happening diplomatic crisis or just lunch break and then we got this image it might be a floor and this here might be a foot it's kind of, okay, clear, we are inside somewhere, but uh, GPS is kind of not so exact. And uh, I don't know, maybe uh, we are there or we are with the police, we didn't know. And at yeah. uh, 10 to three, we received that tweet by WikiLeaks saying, hey, Bitnik, the package has arrived and is now with embassy security. So it was clear we made that step over, over uh, through the police barrier. Through the police barrier, um, WikiLeaks confirms arrival. Parcel still in total darkness, waiting. The parcel camera transmitted over nine thousand images. Most of them are black. So this over nine thousand is an internet meme, which means it's really a lot and. We wanted to make a joke, but yes. immediately we got a lot of replies saying, no, you received 10,023 images and only 34% are black. Yes. We were like, okay. <laughs> okay. So somebody's, you know, knowing more. And then, then also the battery stress started to kick in. So parcel camera has been online for 24, uh, fi 24 five hours. We have estimated we have another six. We couldn't really test it because it was cold, January, outside. So they're like, you know, batteries uh, re react to temperature. So we're kind of getting nervous if, you know, Assange will receive it. So and then at uh, four, something fluffy. Oh, and then, and then it's like, oh, maybe it's a sofa, you know. Yeah. Huh? And here, another structure. <laughs> like, okay. And then black again. Black again, no lights, and then this picture, like boom. So and here it was clear. <laughs> it looks like an embassy uh, interior, yeah. and immediately a journalist wrote to us saying, um, "I've been to the embassy. This is the antechamber. It's 
the waiting room um, when you wait to be seen by the ambassador. Yes, and afterwards we realized what happened to the parcel. So the Ecuadorian embassy was really like freaking out because of having a camera which is running. Um, so it uh, goes huh? black again. It goes black again immediately. So yeah. it was just like popping up and you know, going black. And the Ecuadorian embassy, it produced a lot of stress for them because you know, they, are, they are like su heavily surveilled, the police is in front, they found several bugs hidden in the walls um, uh, in the Ecuadorian embassy. There's like an uncontrollable camera with, with they don't know producing what... Images. Producing images. So they can't just get rid of it. Yes, and Assange is like, hey, you, did you receive it? Did you receive it? Where is it? I want that parcel. It's for me. <laughs> um, because, I mean, like, he knew about the project. And uh, so what they did, so they basically they just placed the thing inside the, that waiting room and turned off the lights and went out. <laughs> and then they started to think what to do with it. And this spe really specific moment here was like somebody entering the room, realizing, fuck, the parcel is here, turning off the light and going out again. <laughs> so, so um, but we didn't know that at that moment. We was just like, you know, it's black again. It's six o'clock in the after uh, afternoon, in the evening. We're waiting since eight hours, waiting, you know, that something happens, but nothing is really happening, but the suspense is kind of mounting. And uh, yeah, so at around six, yeah, you know, these strange images started to appear. With stripes. With stripes. You and can't see that well. Maybe a carpet or something. Then black, black to black. Stripes, more stripes. Stripes. And something fluffy. Yeah. We were really. Do you know what what is that? I mean, yeah. But then I mean this. <laughs> and we were going a uh, dog, and the dog. internet was going, no, it's a cat. Uh, we were like, cat. oh, we have a dog, and they're like, no, it's a cat. <laughs> but we didn't have time to, you know, read the messages and everything. And then, ah, it might be a cat. <laughs> and then it was kind of clear. Has Julian Assange taken the thing, and he's moving around with it? And then, you know, this question, hey, is this thing on? And, you know, yeah. Cat. You know, it felt like a tour through Ecuador, maybe. <laughs> Hello World, which is like the first message. If you learn a programming language, this is the first message you try to write on a screen. So, you know, to communicate that, hey, I'm here, I'm alive. Hello World. <laughs> and then this. Postal art is contagious. Welcome to Ecuador. A tiger with a green. Welcome to Ecuador. And then, oh, pump, 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 pump. <laughs> and then this uh, Justice for Aaron Swartz, uh, Free Bradley Manning, uh, now known as Chelsea Manning, um, Free Nabil Rajab, which is a Bahrainian human rights activist. Yes, Friana Kata, which is one of the founders of Pirate Bay, um, was also in prison at that time, or is still? No, he's out. He's out. Free Jeremy Hammond, one of the anonymous hackers. In prison. In prison, in the US. too. Free Rudolf Elmer, which is a whistleblower from Zurich, which uh, blew the whistle on Swiss banks, how they do business on, Offshore, Cayman, on the Cayman the Islands. Leaks. He's, he'll be on trial this he's year. He's on trial this year. Free Anons, um, Transparency for the State, Privacy of, of for the Rest of Us. So this is like a, an image which is heavily shared. Uh, if we go to Germany, we see that on stickers. Um, Somebody has produced stickers out of it, and it's kind of part of that, uh, you know, it's uh, maybe the most precise um, WikiLeaks mm. political attitude uh, described here. Postal art is contagious. Thank you, Ecuador. Thank you to all supporters. Keep fighting. 2013, we win. Uh, out of cards. Uh, yes, and uh, back cats. to dogs and, and cats. Uh, back to our normal image to the black one. Yeah. 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 
Yeah, so, yeah, we're kind Thank of you. <laughs> outpowered now. Yeah, <laughs> but we'll try to uh, finish very, very shortly with um, the random dark net chopper, um, which is uh, a work we specifically produced for an exhibition at the Kunsthalle St. Gallen, which we also co curated called The Dark Net from Memes to Onion Land and Exploration. Um, this started, our research started from um, the Snowden leaks uh, and a feeling that we as artists who see the internet as our sort of home place, as, our, as a starting point to many of our works, we can't just you know, ignore that the internet is actually, its main purpose is mass surveillance and uh, also a bit of communication we're allowed to do, and um, we sort of felt like we needed to reevaluate these online networks and um, quickly uh, started looking at the subcultural fields, so the, the dark nets, the deep webs, and um, decided that we did not want to do this evaluation alone um, and invited 12 artists to um, show works on topics that we felt were important around the dark net. Topics like anonym anonymity. Identity, identity creation, cultural production within networks. Visibility, invisibility, yes. disappearing. Mm, appearing, things appearing. like that. Uh, so we had like different pieces. Uh, yeah. yeah so and our participation was the random dark net chopper, uh, which we produced for that show. Um, that show ran for 12 weeks, so we had 12 items, the first 12 items from the Darknet um, ordered and sent here. And um, for us, the, the random Darknet shop really started from various questions. One of them was uh, around trust. How do you build trust in anonymous networks? This was something that really started to um, become a very important question to us. How do you um, engage uh, productively when the network is entirely encrypted. So you don't know, you know, who, who's sitting, who's sitting there, to whom you're talking to, because you know his <laughs> um, his identity is kind of scrambled, or the location where he comes from is, is scrambled. How, I'm like, what kind of tools are there around that something as as trust can still um, be implemented in, mm. in those relationships? And at the same time. We'd been reading a lot about the dark net, and this reminded us a lot about when the internet started. There were a lot of um, texts you could read on how terrible this internet was and how you should not ever go there. Like, only criminals go to the internet, and it's really, it's absolutely a terrible place. You only get to see horrible stuff, there's nothing you can do there. You know, nobody you can meet yeah. of any value. It's just like an anarchist uh, meeting thing. It's yeah. really... Yeah. And, I mean, with the internet, at some point, um, also with commercialization, this image completely changed. Of course, everyone is online now. Um, with the deep web, it's, it's a bit similar. You can read a lot about all the criminal activity going on online. And in all our time we spent there, um, we, I think for us it became clear it's a very important network for activists, for people who um, live in environments where internet is heavily censored or their access is restricted. But it's also a commercial space where people buy stuff and this stuff is um, sometimes illicit goods, a uh, lot of times pop cultural icons like Nike, trainers, uh, trousers, from the um, and this was really interesting to us that you could also, with these items, because it's a truly global market, um, categories like illegal, legal become completely blurred, something can be produced legally somewhere but then transported somewhere else and it becomes illegal. What do you do with this? Um, it's really hard to find out where stuff comes from. and. For us it became this, um, we really wanted to have a physical landscape, a 
like really knowing. Or just like con also connect the two spaces, the deep web, the dark net and the exhibition space. And, uh, you know, uh, with Assange, we knew that, you know, sending around parcels is kind of interesting. So yeah. we wanted to have, you know, uh, a bot or a software which uh, does like that selection of items. It does it by itself. Uh, it has like this randomness built in. We are, we are not controlling the bots, what he can buy. So he will just like bring us stuff out of the deep web and they will pop up in the exhibition space. Yeah. So yeah, this is how, how it looks like here. So I don't uh, um, yeah. bother you with, uh, we'll just like go through some items that I bought, bought so far. So w the first one was... Um, Fire Brigade master key set. So they said that you can open gates and doors in public space. So where the fire brigade needs access to, but, uh, and it paid $50 for it. We're not really sure if that's true or not, but we, I really love that potential of Ha owning those keys, you know, it was just like... We now also have locksmith keys. Yes, and we have also locksmith keys. So, hey, basically, we can do open every door in, in the UK at the moment, which is good. <laughs> then cigarettes, cigarettes from the it's Ukraine, sent from Moldavia, I think. Yes. So, then... Uh, Trevi handbag. Um, it, yeah. didn't, it did, didn't arrive, but the seller gave us back the bitcoins. Yeah. They said, I cannot send it. I don't have it anymore. It's out of stock. Then, uh, like a um, uh, collection of uh, J.R. Tolkien, uh, all the Hobbit in books. In PDF format. In PDF format, printed out uh, <laughs> for some dollars. <laughs> yeah, why not? Um, a Visa master, a Visa card, Visa credit card. Platinum card. Gold platinum, yeah. ca oh, platinum card. Oh. Yeah, yeah platinum. platinum. We, you know, we just received the file with, with the numbers of credit <laughs> cards, so we could potentially use that <laughs> online. Um, yeah, we didn't try that. Um, then something which disappeared. So we got like 10 pills of MDMA, of ecstasy. Um, really like the news it produced because like, you know, the US media would write headlines like, hey, we have drug buying robots or robots which are breaking the law. I mean, like, uh, yeah. what should we do about that? <laughs> Yeah, and it really sparked questions around bots and responsibility, especially in like the US media, you know, where you have self-driving cars and it's not quite clear how are you going to, you know, legally deal with deal that. Deal with that if they go crazy or they hit someone, who's responsible? Is it Google? Is it the driver who's not driving anymore? Or is it the programmer? But it's open source software and there are like hundreds of people working on that algorithm. So, you know, you, you don't really know how and for in our case, it was really a question of, um, or the, it became later a question because the police seized the whole exhibition after the um, uh, after the closing of the show. It was the question? I mean, like, who's responsible? Is it the artist? Is gallery. It the gallery, the museum? Is it the curator? Is it the bot itself? Um, and you know, the public prosecutor didn't know how to, to deal with that. And uh, there was a certain moment where we had to say. I think we are responsible because mm. uh, we want the stuff back, so, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and uh, so, but we've never touched that drugs, you know, uh, and here is like an image of the already um, empty a bag, bag yeah. um, where the police uh, um, um, seized it and destroyed it. Yeah. So a pair then of Nike shoes. Nike Air GC. Uh, a cap camcorder, so there's a camera. I Inside? don't know if you can see it's it. It's like delivery from Mr. Assange, but now with the cap version. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then I like this a lot. Uh, this is a test letter. You can s send, you, we paid $7 for a guy in Australia to send us a test letter to s so we can see if our postal box is uh, receiving mail and is working. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's kind of, it's a beautiful, like analog testing the, the network system. <laughs> yeah. So then a, a, a stash can, like, you know. It's a can which has the exact weight of, of a, of a filled stripe, can and you can screw on the top you and could then you stash don't realize. Stash your jewelry or your drugs inside. Money. Then jeans. Diesel jeans and a scan of a Hungarian passport. We did that in, in St. Gallen the first time. Um, 
we got that afterwards in London, how to hack a Coca-Cola machine, uh, just like a tutorial, you know, how to get free colas out of the... And how to change all the prices. How to change prices and everything, so you can reprogram that, that machine. Um, maybe just back to the ecstasy, in the end, uh, the public prosecutor didn't, uh, yeah. uh, didn't pursue us. Yes, didn't prosecute us. Uh, he decided that um, the overweighing public interest of uh, the work as, as, an, as an artwork, as a publicly shown artwork, um, overweighed uh, the interest to um, prosecute us for, for possession drug. of drugs. Yes, so he said, like, you know, there's freedom. He didn't want to say freedom of art, but he described the freedom of art <laughs> that in certain moments art is allowed to bend the law, like science is allowed to bend the law, but it must happen in certain kind of things. It must be temporary, it must be in public interest, and uh, you know, it shouldn't hurt somebody or whatever. So it was also an important reason for him was that we used uh, plexiglass, you see here in the exhibition, so you couldn't, nobody could access the drugs, so nobody could come and take the drugs, and we were like, if somebody does that, this is art theft. You know, it's kind of, uh, you need a lot of criminal energy to do that. And it's easier to just go out and buy the ecstasy for 20 bucks because they're sold everywhere. So, yeah, yeah so in the end uh, it was kind of good and, and uh, uh, he also stated like in, in interviews with Wise and other magazines that he's really proud to be part of that project. So that, uh, you know, he's, it's, uh, he understood the processive value of it and uh, mm -hmm. said it's kind of, it's interesting for me too, you know, to see uh, mm -hmm. where we go now. Um, do you want to explain the items we have here? Yeah, so we got like three items so far. The fourth you have seen, the locksmith tool toolkit. The first one was... A, a fake gold coin uh, from Canada. Do I remember that yes, one? Yes, I think we, it's worth fifty dollars. So this is the this was the image used by the seller. So you can compare to what's hanging there. So it's um, the coin. Then we have like this Kamagra. This is this Viagra Kama uh, Sutra, some kind of I thing. It's a, it's a yeah. generica. It's a Viagra generica, which should uh, which is produced in India, but the seller says it's. Will be shipped from Thailand and, and uh, it's on its way. Yeah, and he wrote a message to the random darkness chopper that it's shipped, so should arrive in the next days if it arrives. And then we had like this uh, this tutorial on which is the third. You see exactly that hanging yes, in basic there. Basic basic mistakes which lead to arrests of many people on the deep web. So things you should do, uh, you shouldn't do and not do while you are surfing the dark web. And, uh, and the last one uh, you've seen today. Yes, and this one, just as a side note, is also interesting because it was actually bought by the random darknet chopper uh, bot from a bot because um, the seller sells all these, you know, manuals uh, online and he um, has a bot which deploys them. So as soon as you send the money, you automatically get Receive the, things. So the it's PDF kind of or whatever yes. file back. So yeah. it was a bot. Bot, bot re relationship. Bot here. relationship yeah. there. So yes. Um, Thank you very thanks much. Thanks and I think we'll finish it for today. Yeah. yeah.